worshipped you as we have worshipped you in song and in fellowship. We have heard of opportunities for service that have been shared with us. We're the body of Christ. And we believe that Jesus is living and with us here now. Your word, indeed, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Lord, may I be very careful in how I wield that sword this morning. Hide me behind the cross and let Jesus show forth. We prayed this before we started service when anyone else was in this room this morning. We pray, Lord, that, that minds and hearts won't be set on, on the pastor we were expecting to hear or struggling to get to know this new guy, but rather that we will realize God's Word is true and that Jesus is here and it's all about Him. He is to have first place in everything. And so we give you this hour and we believe that our lives and this time are on purpose And that purpose be to glorify the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You only get one chance to create a first impression. But an impact lasts a lifetime. In fact, as I have been here this this morning with you, if you have not heard me speak before, already you have formed an opinion about me. Because we went through that first impression impression experience i repeat you only get one chance to create a first impression when you go for a job interview or that first date you only get one chance to create a first impression but an impact lasts a lifetime that's going to be our working theme this morning as i speak to you on the topic impressing the oppressor impressing The oppressor. It is accurate to say that all of us know what an oppressor is because all of us at different phases in our life, in different places of our life, have somebody that is on our case and in our face. It may be an employer who is unfair and unjust. It might be a neighbor who's infringing their lifestyle onto us. If you're in college, some of you might be at UH Manoa. You might have a roommate that is driving you absolutely nuts. Let me tell you this story from my roommate. He and I were in school back when they didn't have pencils. And he was my roommate. He was from Virginia Beach. And it was a classic. I, we, you know, we're two guys in the dorm. And one day, at about, I don't know, Eight weeks into the semester, I decided I'm going to change my sheets. Maybe it was ten weeks. I decide I'm going to change. We used to clean our room by waiting for the dust bunnies to gather, and then you just go get them and throw them away. It's a great way to dust. And so I took the sheets off of my bed, and I saw him. Great. He started taking the sheets off his bed. And then he took my sheets and put them on his bed. That's disgusting. Maybe you've got somebody that's that's difficult to live with. Maybe you've got a, a, somebody that cuts you off on the freeway. They're in your lane and, and they wanted yours to get out of your way and so forth. And so, no, I didn't say that very well, but that's all right. Neither does Waxer all the time. So, The point being, sometimes in our life, if not oft times in our life, we have an oppressor, somebody who makes life difficult for us. And so as we share this morning around the themes, Impressing the oppressor, you and I understand that reality. And if you don't, you'll experience it in the very near future. I'm going to show you one of those in Scripture this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles, please. I love to be in this place because I know you value the Word of God and you have it near in your hand and in your heart. We're going to Acts chapter 16, the story of the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16, Paul is having relentless ministry. For the first time, he experiences some encumbrances and impediments in Asia Minor. God gives a supernatural vision. They go over to Macedonia, to Greece, modern-day Greece. And they're expecting great things. Their first ministry is with some wahinis out by the river. But then the Lord starts to move. They're in the city of Philippi. But as often happens, when you're about the things of Jesus, you encounter opposition. Some of you in this room have encountered opposition because you have values, because you have direction. Because you have identity in your life and you dare say what you are about. Some folks aren't comfortable with that. This happened with Paul and with Silas. We pick it up in Acts chapter 16 beginning with the 22nd verse. And the crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten 
with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. And the jailer had been roused out of sleep, and had seen the prison doors open. He drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. He called for lights, rushed in, trembling down with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, and after he had brought them out, he said unto them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, the oppressor in this case that I want us to consider is different than the way this passage is normally exegeted, normally divided apart and studied. We usually focus on Paul and Silas and their life and their faith and their ministry there in jail. I want us this morning to think about that jailer. He is the oppressor we are going to consider. Think about him. It was just another day's work. This is his craft. This is his job. He works in the prison. I'm not sure it's a a career he would have chosen. I'm not sure that he, as a young man, said, I'm going to major in criminal science and and figure out a way to go into the prison business. I imagine he was drafted into that job and told what he was supposed to do. As he gathered his lunch pail that day and kissed his wife and went off to work, it was time for him to give me about another day's work in a very unpleasant place. Not the most comfortable of working conditions, mind you. And apparently he wasn't high up on the seniority list because he's having to work the night shift. I guess, in the words of the Beatles song, it's going to be for him a hard day's night. Some of you in this crowd are saying, the who's? The Beatles. Just, just think about it for a minute. In his case, as he is there in this encounter with these two preachers whom he's got for prisoners that night, and his job is to beat them and to bind them and to put them into the inner stocks, binding their hands and their feet together. This man, without any preparation for it, without any future understanding what was going to happen to him that night in the normal course of his life, is going to make an amazing journey. He is going to go from just being a guy with a job, just being a jailer, to becoming a believer. He's going to make a tremendous transformation from being an abuser, a professional, skilled abuser, to now becoming a brother. It's a tremendous leap all in one night's time. How did that happen? Impressing the oppressor. Let me tell you the story. In the early months of 1942, In 1941, around the first part of November, ships left Fukuoka Harbor and and Tokyo Bay, and they they sailed throughout the North Pacific up north of our islands. As you know, they made a long loop to come in stealth, and they anchored off of the northern shore of Kauai. And on December the 7th, 1941, they came down here, and they bombed about, what, six miles from here, Pearl Harbor. They bombed the bejesus out of it, killing thousands and thousands of people. The United States, boy, had taken a sucker punch right in the nose. We needed desperately some boost for morale. And so aircraft carriers left Pearl Harbor and sailed out into the Pacific Ocean in the early months of 1942. And under the stealth of that secret plan, their goal was to launch a symbolic, it wasn't strategic, but it was symbolic to boost morale, bombing raid that would leave those aircraft carriers undetected by the Japanese, would fly over Tokyo, would bomb the city, and then they would fly on past, in, past occupied China until they got into the area of Myanmar, Burma, and so forth. They would land safely, and those pilots would eventually get back home. Somehow they were detected perhaps by a, a Japanese submarine, and so they, 
they had to move into position and launch sooner than planned. That meant that their flight was longer than they intended it to be and that the required amount of fuel would not get them beyond enemy territory. They dropped their bombs, the Doolittle Raid it was called. They dropped their bombs in Tokyo. It was a tremendous morale boost for the Allies, for the American public. Finally, we're hitting back a little bit. We didn't win much, but at least we've made an in. We punched them back, and we've shown them we're not going to take this lying down. But the pilots understood you're not going to have enough fuel to get out of occupied territory. Fly toward China. And when you get there and you finally run out of fuel, ditch your plane and do the best you can. One of those pilots on that bombing raid, the Doolittle Raid, was a fellow by the name of Jake DeShazer. Jacob DeShazer. He bailed out of his plane and he was captured. Fortunate to survive, but he was captured by the Japanese. For the next 40 months, he would be a prisoner of war, first in China, moved throughout different islands, and then ultimately taken back to Japan. In those 40 months in which he was a prisoner of the Japanese, he was beaten, he was starved, he was abused in every way possible. Inhuman treatment was given to Jake DeShazer. For 24 of those 40 months, he was held in solitary confinement, talking to no one. For one period during the, those 40 months that he was a prisoner of Japan, there was a Bible that was allowed to be circulated throughout the POW camps. And for three weeks, the Bible was in his cell and he spent time with God's Word. Not much else to do except nurse your injuries and your grudges. Jake DeShazer began to spend time in God's Word and in so doing met Jesus Christ in a life-changing way. Christ came into that prison cell. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And from that point on, was a follower of Christ. While he was in that prison cell, the Holy Spirit began to work in his life. And even though he was being captive, he began to say, love Japanese. What are you talking about? Love the Japanese. The war ended. DeShazer came back to the United States, reunited with his family, but he could not escape what was echoing in his soul. Love Japanese. And so he left the comforts of his life back in America and moved back to post-war Japan, which was not an easy place, which was not a comfortable society in which to live in those days. And he was there in Japan and began to share with the Japanese people the love that Christ had given him for his former captors. In fact, he produced a tract that it was called, I Was a Prisoner of Japan. One day, outside the Ueno train station in Tokyo, my wife and I have been there. Ueno is an incredible place in Tokyo. But outside the Ueno train station, a a young man in his late 20s, I suppose, maybe early 30s by that time, of the name of Fujio Matsuda. He had been the early leader of the raid upon Pearl Harbor. It was his plane that heard the order, tora, 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 and left the aircraft carriers, flew around the Waianae Mountains, over the Eva Plain, and dropped the first bombs in Pearl Harbor. He had been taught to give his life for the emperor and to hate the Americans. Now in post-war defeat, shame, and disillusionment, Somebody put that track in his hand. He didn't pay much attention to it, got on the train, and Ueno rode back to Nihonbashi or wherever he was from and went home. Sometime later, he picked up that track, and the track said, I was a prisoner of Japan, written by Jake DeShazer. And he heard the stories he read there, how DeShazer had been abused by the Japanese people and now was back to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. Fujio Matsuda made a commitment to Jesus Christ, gave his heart to the Lord. And I am here to testify that on more than one occasion, Jake DeShazer and Fujio Mitsuda would stand on the same podium together in different parts of the world and share the hope that Christ could provide, that bombs and bullets could never do. That is a fact of history. And in fact, my wife will know there was somebody from the Big Island that 30 years ago, I met who told me, yes, I was with Fujio Matsuda the first time he returned to Hawaii and he preached the gospel here in these islands. I said, tell me about it. He said, I took him to Aea Heights and we looked down over Pearl Harbor. I said, what did he say? The first time he had seen Pearl Harbor since the one time he had bombed it. He said he didn't say anything. Typical samurai style. He just stood and he just looked. 
looked and he looked. How can you explain what happened with Matsuda? And how can you explain what happened with Deshazer except we've got the reality in Christ of impressing the oppressor? That's the goal we want to be about. All of us have, have oppressors in our life. Somebody who makes things difficult for us. Someone who has been unjust. Someone who is unfair. Is there hope? I want to give you this morning out of this passage of Scripture, because God's Word is true, a very simple strategy, and it's two part. The first would be initial impression and lasting impact. Let's dig into the passage. First, I lay before you initial impression. Look in the passage there in Acts chapter 16 and what's going on in the middle of the night? Though they have beaten, been beaten and shackled and abused for proclaiming Christ, Paul and Silas refuse to not love Jesus. They are continuing to worship in both song and in prayer. They are apparently putting into practice what we see in Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, not just when you got an A on the test, but when you get a difficult time in class, not just when your marriage is great guns, but when there are the tough times. Rejoice in the Lord always in the midst of the trial. Now, let's be honest. Don't make the passage say something it doesn't say, Hankins. They did not impress the jailer. How do I say that? Because verse 27 says that he was roused out of his sleep. Let's be honest about that. While they're praising God and having a wonderful time of worship, he's back there sawing logs. He could care less. He's not impressed by those Christians. But I'm going to submit to you that that night in that prison, a number of extraordinary miracles happened. The first is that two Christians would praise God after the, the bottom had been turned up on them. As life was so painful and so difficult, they were continuing to praise God. That is miracle number one. But notice miracle number two. And we're not even yet to the earthquake when there's an amazing emancipation. That's not what we're talking about, a miracle. Miracle number two is what verse 25 says. It says, while they were praising God at midnight in jail, the other prisoners were listening to them. That, my friends, is a miracle because you would expect to see that it would say, and Paul and Silas were worshiping and praising God and the other prisoners were saying, hey, shut up. That's what you would expect. But that's not what happened. There's something compelling about when God's people authentically worship him. And unbelievers watch and they listen. The Bible says in more than one place that praise is becoming of the upright. I think that has something to do with authentic praise and not fake hype. Now, that's another story. We won't go there. But let me just lay that challenge before you. But then the extraordinary miracle happens. Miracle number three of the earthquake. Chains fall off, shackles, doors open. And this is an amazing experience. Here comes the greatest miracle that perhaps had happened that night. Worshipping in the middle of the night, prisoners listening, earthquake, but here comes one. Notice in verse 28, I believe it is, where Paul says to the jailer, don't do yourself any harm because we are all here. There's an extraordinary miracle. I want you to picture if we were to have a huge earthquake in Halava today. And all of the high securities would stop working and the gates would open and the prisoners would have an opportunity to hit the streets of Honolulu. I'm telling you, that place would empty out faster than you guys will this morning. That would happen in Folsom Prison. It would happen anywhere. But for whatever reason, those prisoners stayed put. I can't explain that, except the variable factor is these Christian believers somehow had a sticky influence upon them. What's going on there? What would have made that impact? Let me look before you three things. First is their worship. That there, as I said a moment ago, they were just continually, authentically in love with Jesus as they worshiped him in the midst of life's difficult trials. Your worship never resounds so firmly as when your life is its most pained. Then people are watching you. Then they are hearing, how is it you praise God in the midst of this struggle, this illness, this financial crisis? Their worship. Secondly, in verse 31, you'll see their witness. We only will mention it now, but simply that Paul 
was able to articulate the gospel to this man to say how he could meet Jesus Christ. I know that in this church you are trained how to articulate your faith, how to be able to lead someone to know the same Jesus you do. They witness in very clear and compelling terms. My favorite verse for evangelism is 1 Peter 3.15. Always be sanctified first. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Make sure that your heart has one Lord, Jesus. Secondly, always prepared to make a defense for the hope that is within you to anyone who asks. It says something about relationship and that privately you are prepared so that you can respond in the proper way because the last part of that verse says, yet with gentleness and respect, that is timing and tact. Somehow, we as Christians figure out how to properly tell our story in the right context. So we've got their worship, their witness, and as you're going to see as this passage unfolds, their walk, the quality of their life, both in prison and out of prison and back in prison again, is absolutely extraordinary. At this point, the striking feature is that they refuse to escape. They refuse to to escape. And that fact in particular so impacts this hardened prison jailer, this guard. Just think of the kind of people he dealt with on a daily basis. What was his business, his craft? He had to be thick-skinned. But This caught his eye. That these prisoners, whom he had just beaten up, did not take the opportunity to run away. And somehow it so profoundly affected him that he went in a moment's notice from the brink of suicide, and I'll say more later why he was going to kill himself, from the brink of suicide to falling on his face asking, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? From suicide to new life in Jesus Christ. That's a pretty quick leap in a very brief time. You want to talk about an initial impression? Whoa! Paul and Silas have really made their mark. Now, can I ask you, what is your initial impression? When folks see you, when they encounter you, what do they see? What do they hear? What do they smell? You know, the Bible says that we are to be a fragrant aroma to Christ. And if somebody come into this church this morning and you never out oh, out, oh, but you think you can spray on the perfume and it works, that's why I see some empty seats there. Somebody said, I can't handle. You see, if you and I try to, to, to look the part and we try to sound the part, but we're still pilau on the inside, guess what? The real smell seeps out. Is that not true? The Bible says we are a fragrant aroma under Christ. So my question is, when folks encounter you, what do they see? What do they hear? And what do they smell, especially if they spend time around you? That initial impression. How are you different? And maybe I can give you another word. How are you authentic in your worship? Particularly when life doesn't go the way you want it to go. Are you still able to maintain your faith and your testimony in Jesus Christ? Do you have joy in the midst of pain and sorrow? That's where the rubber meets the road. Your worship, your witness. Are you able to articulate the Christian faith? Or do you come here every Sunday and dutifully take notes and then let it go out of your mind as soon as you leave here? Or are you truly growing and being rooted and grounded in your faith and becoming a fruitful and productive citizen of the kingdom of God. And let me ask you thirdly, how is your walk with the Lord? Just your daily life. And I love it. You know, this is not where we serve God doing what I do. We serve God in the daily life, in the daily trenches. Those of you who are students, you're serving God in the classroom and you're serving God on the campus and in the eating hall. Those of you who work in a factory or those of you who work in a, in a store, maybe you're a teacher, wherever it is, you serve God in your home, in your neighborhood, with your workmates. That's where your walk shows its clearest and people want to know about Jesus. When I was a pastor on Kauai, I'll never forget there was this motorcycle guy, former Vietnam vet. 
He started coming to our church and he said, Stan, you know the reason I come to your church? I said, why is that, Pete? He said, because I never dreamt you were a preacher. So you understand that you got a pastor as well who refuses to, to fit the mold, but says, I'm going to take my faith and try to make it authentic and try to make it real. What is your walk with Jesus Christ like? That's why in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you, folks like you and me, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill. And when people, they're watching your life, they are observing your life, and they will see your good works, what do they do? Praise you and say, boy, that's just incredible. You're just the most wonderful person. I want to be just like you. Is that what they say? Jesus said, they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You and I want to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be the light. I prayed this morning before I got up here to preach what I've prayed for a bunch of years that I've been preaching, that I, the words of John the Baptist, that I might decrease so, so that Christ might increase. They refused to escape. And when you and I take the high road in life, folks notice. When you and I take the high road, when, for example, you go to 7-Eleven and you're tanking a big gulp and a spam musubi, and you give them a $10 bill and they give you too much change, and instead of going, whole oh, score, and out you go, you say, excuse me, you gave me too much change. You think that person doesn't notice that? When you and I make a decision not to answer harsh words with harsh words, the Bible says the soft answer turneth away wrath. My lovely wife, some years ago, was facing a significant medical challenge. Her doctor, her general practitioner here in this town, repeatedly, casually failed to diagnose her. It was serious. She nearly died. Another doctor, eventually, we found the problem through tr extensive treatment. She's here today. And I praise God. But I want you to understand something. As Brenda was going through those treatments and was getting better, she said, you know, I'm mad at my doctor. And I'm thinking we ought to sue him for malpractice. He nearly let me die. We had that discussion in our home. And I said, well, I understand that, dear. I'm, I'm upset with him, too. But I read here in Corinthians, it says in 1 Corinthians 7 and elsewhere, that if you're Christians, you're not supposed to take one another to court. And I understand that our doctor goes to the other church in town and says, that a church? Maybe we need to rethink that. My wife, pretty quiet gal, she just thought, hmm, there he goes again, that stupid stuff. And then, unbeknownst to me, she made an appointment with her old doctor. And she later told me what happened. She went in to see her doctor, and she said, Doctor, I am very angry with you. You did not diagnose my problem, I told you repeatedly what was wrong. And you did not die. You didn't, you didn't work hard enough. And I nearly died. And then she said, I cried. And she said, and my doctor cried. And they concluded their appointment. There has been no lawsuit. I do not have that new Jaguar I was planning on. <laughs> Don't we had it. That did not happen. Because. She took the high road. When you take the high road, folks, that is inescapable. And your initial impression is indelible. Now the jailer. We have seen the impact, uh, the, the impression that Paul and Silas lay upon him. He asks, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they are able to share with him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Okay, that happens there in jail. Then we're told that, that that earthquake happened at midnight. So sometime after midnight is when they're having their evangelistic proclamation and counseling and, and leading this guy through the sinner's prayer, whatever all of that was. But then here's what the passage tells us happened next. Somewhere between the hours of 12 midnight and I suppose 6 a.m. The jailer takes Paul and Silas out of the jail and in the middle of the night, his poor Mrs. Jailer is at home and she hears... She staggers out of bed and she goes to the door and she opens it and she says, well, what are you doing here? What time is it? And who are those guys with you? What happened to them? 
did you do this? Is that what your job is? What kind of monster am I married to? And then he says something even more perplexing. Honey, let us in. Fix some food. These guys are going to talk to us. They're going to do something called preaching. What's that? They're going to preach. They're going to tell us about Jesus. Who's that? And they share Christ. They give him, they give, the family gives them food. The whole family come and are baptized. And then that Paul and Silas have their wounds washed. That's the amazing thing that happened in the wee hours of the morning. But the story is not done. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to verses 35 and 36. Here's where it gets really interesting. Now, when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer, our hero in the story, the bad guy turned good. The jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrate has sent to release you. Now, therefore, come out and go in peace. If he is speaking to Paul and Silas and says, come out and go ahead and leave in peace, where are they? they got to be back in jail. Before, the night before, in the midst of the darkness and the earthquake, they refused to escape. That's miracle big time. But here's one even more. They refused to exploit To play something to their advantage. They refused to kind of twist it and to find their own benefit to come out of the situation. They refused to exploit for expediency. i got to ask the question, why? Why did they refuse in the middle of the night to just go on and leave? Can I give you two prime motivations for Christians who say, you know, this is not going to be easy. But there's something more important going on here, and we're gonna, we're gonna make a difference with our lives. Let me give you just two words. The first is the word testimony. The word testimony. I can't help but think that in this passage, they were thinking about those original prisoners who were listening to them praise in the middle of the night. And they surely thought to themselves, if we don't go back to jail, then all those prisoners know is this. We're singing in the middle of the night. There's an earthquake. We have some kind of a little conversation with the jailer. We leave with him. They stay in jail and we fly to coop. And they must have thought, if we do that, what will those fellow prisoners think about all of our worship? About all of our witness? They will not see our walk with Jesus Christ. We have to go back to jail because of them. We have a responsibility to them. We have been giving our testimony about Christ before them. That's why I was reading in 1 Peter where he says, keep, he writes to Christians and Peter says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, among people who don't understand spiritual things, so that when they see your behavior, they will not malign you because of your good works. Now listen to me closely, people. What, what, is, what does Waxer say? All eyes up here, people. All eyes up here. In fact, let me do my Waxer impersonation. Okay. All eyes. I practiced that. Okay. Pretty good legs, though, y'all. Yeah? Okay. Um, now I'm lost. Where was I? Testimony. Peter said, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. All eyes here as I share with you in all candor. Live mindful of your testimony. Let it be on your mind, at the forefront of your thinking, that you, ha- you are accountable to others who are watching. You see, when I stand before you now, if you see me this week out in town and I'm behaving in a way that does not bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to say, hmm said one thing on Sunday, look on Thursday. Think about the the pressure that Wayne Cordero is under. Think about the pressure that Pastor Waxer is under because he's on TV all the time. That means you can't go anywhere in this town without being known. That's the way it ought to be. 
You chose to follow this Lord Jesus Christ. You chose to say, I'm not just living in the, in the, in, in the flesh. I'm not just living in the world. I am named by the name of Jesus Christ. I am a blood-bought child of God. Then live mindful of your testimony. I remember when I was preaching to my church years ago, I came up with this line. I thought, boy, this is a good one. I'm going to use it a lot. You, here we go. You and you alone are responsible for what goes into your mouth and out of it. I heard one amen. Could I hear at least two more? Thank you. Let's repeat it. You and you alone. Well, that's, no, that's not really what I... Planned. Let's not go too far. I work alone, basically, here. I don't have money in my budget for staff, so I can't do that. Yeah, 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 okay. Work for free? All right. You, if you want to say it, it would go ahead then, I guess. You and you alone. You, you like that thing. Are you getting bored? Is that why you're doing this, to try to stay awake? Yeah. Here we go, then. Okay, we'll do this. You and you alone are responsible for what goes into your mouth and what comes out of it. Let's make that simpler. I and I alone am responsible. Say that. There you go. Live mindful of your testimony. Paul and Silas were mindful of their testimony to those other prisoners that they were willing to stand up and say, how great is our God. They, no, no, they realized we got to put up or shut up. Secondly, not only is testimony, but responsibility. Responsibility. Now, where are we going with this? May I suggest to you that we've got to consider the main character of the story, not Paul and Silas. The main character of this passage, I feel, is that the, we've got this jailer who has gone from being a jailer to a believer from being an abuser to now he is their brother in Jesus Christ. They have just shared the gospel with him. They've just prayed with him. They've just baptized him. And here's what surely must have begun to happen in their mind. They had to understand. Remember earlier when he pulled the sword and was going to, to commit suicide? The reason being, in the Roman culture of the day, if you're a jailer and your prisoners escape, you pay with your life the penalty they were going to pay. If they were going to be executed, okay, we'll execute you for letting them go. Paul and Silas understand, and Paul would later write to the Galatian churches. He said in chapter 6, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. He went on to say in chapter 6, verse 10 of Galatians, don't get tired of doing good, especially to those of the household of faith. In other words, go really far and work really hard with those in the family of God. I imagine at about 4.30 in the morning, there was a tense little discussion that happened in that jailer's home. That Paul said, Silas, come here. Okay, it's about 4.30, we got to go back to jail. Silas is saying, excuse me, uh, check, check out, they, they, your face is still bruised. This is not good. We go back to jail, we're dead men. We've been set free, the guy's accepted Christ, let's move on, we can go have ministry somewhere else. Paul says, no, we've got to go back to jail because what happens to this man? What happens to our brother in Christ? Look at all this. Look at his family. This is all our family in Christ. We've got a responsibility to them. So Paul and Silas are stuck on the horns of a moral dilemma. Friends, it raises the issue of sacrifice. I preach in churches all over the country. In fact, my motto is proclaiming Christ's aloha throughout the islands, across the nation, and around the world. And what I am finding, particularly in churches like this, that are geared with a generation that I'm looking at this morning. It's the thrill me, chill me, fill me generation. It says, give me a drive through experience. What can God do for me? Because remember, God, you work for me to help me on my journey of self-achievement. That's the norm nowadays. And it's very concerning. Because the Christian life is the way of the cross. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We are looking to lose our life, not to save our life. And then we will find it. 
One of my colleagues, a former NFL wide receiver who's preaching the gospel now. I myself could have been a star quarterback if I'd have just had the chance, I'm telling you. But he, whenever he and I are together, he's always talking about the way of the cross. We've got to go the way of the cross, whether it's in our finances, whether it's in our meetings, whether it's in our organization, or whether it's in our daily life. How do you and I go the way of the cross? That's what Jesus told us we're supposed to be about. Therefore, when he says, your friend says, walk with, me, walk with me one mile, you gladly walk too. When your friend says, I need your coat, you say, here's my shirt also. Let me extend myself for you. I want you to think what happened with this jailer. The next day, when he picks up his lunch pail, gives his wife a kiss, he thinks to himself, now I'm going to work as a Christian jailer. I imagine he had his own moral dilemma or two. The next time his boss said, beat up these believers, he had to figure out what that meant. That's a good thing for Christians to be put in moral dilemmas. But I'm sure he thought to himself, gee, if it hadn't been for Paul and Silas, I wouldn't have a job. Come to think of it, I wouldn't have salvation. Come to think of it, I wouldn't have a life. And don't you think that he lived every day of his life in gratitude for Paul and Silas? But even more profound when his wife would give him his lunch and kiss him on the cheek and say, have a good night at work, honey. She would say to her kids, just think, kids. If it hadn't been for those two preachers, your dad wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't have a husband. You wouldn't have a dad. Because they lived sacrificially. These two men had not only shared Christ verbally, they had showed Christ sacrificially. You make a lasting impact when you live sacrificially. I'm a one morning wonder here. I'm not going to impact your life on a daily ongoing basis. How do you and I get beyond that initial impression that we make upon people? You make a lasting impact. It lingers in people's lives when you live sacrificially. Then it stays with them. Let's talk now in bringing this home in for a landing about your oppressor. Now, I must say parenthetically, I pray that you're not the oppressor in your context, that you're not giving somebody a hard time, that you are fair decent and just. But I can say with confidence that you do have an oppressor. Every one of us has somebody on our case, in our face, making life difficult. It can be a roommate. It can be a spouse. It can be an ex-spouse. Somebody once said marriage isn't forever, but ex-wives are. It's a thought. Every one of us understands the reality of having an oppressor. Maybe it's your employer. Somebody who's making life difficult for you. Can I give you an alternative? That perhaps in Christ your oppressor is your opportunity? Because that oppressor is watching you, is listening to you, and others are watching you. In the 60s, they talked about hippies being the counterculture people and living alternative lifestyle and all that. Folks, we're followers of Jesus Christ. Look at the world. We are the ultimate counterculture. We are the ones who are not in step with this society. You want to make your mark? Follow Jesus. Now, you've heard the old phrase, I don't get mad, I just get even. Hmm? Some of you may have said that. I don't get mad, but I just get even. Let me give you another, again, alternative lifestyle. You want one? I'll give you an alternative lifestyle. I don't get mad. I don't get even. We just get right. We figure out a way to make it pono. We figure out a way to heal the breach. You and I impress our oppressor with our initial impression and a lasting impact. I'm going to conclude by telling you a story. My father... My father was a printer for 35 years. My mom was a maid. And that's how I, part of the way I got through school. Dad used to come home every day with ink under his fingernails. He worked in a print shop where there were about 
30 employees, let's say. He can't hear very well now. He's 88 years old because those presses making all that noise. Dad told a story when he was about 50, I suppose. There was a young guy who started working in the print shop. His name was Butch. And Butch came out of the Catholic experience. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. But Butch, for whatever reason, had an axe to grind against Christians and against my dad and happened to be Methodist. So he decided to, because he didn't know how to articulate, I don't like Christians. So he just picked on Methodists. And he's always chewing and, and fussing at dad. And when they were playing their poker and so forth and dad didn't participate, he'd make snide comments. And when dad would stay during his lunch hour over to the side and maybe read his little good news for modern man, you've ever seen that little translation of the Bible and so forth, dad would read that because he's a simple man and he could understand that English. And Butch would have his snide comments. One day Butch thought he really had a coup. He found a bottle of vodka, brought it to work and put it in my dad's locker and thought we're really going to get a laugh out of this. And dad was cool. Didn't say anything. Just let it go. This wasn't my dad's first rodeo, if you know what I mean. So dad just let it go, continued to live his life authentically for the love of Jesus Christ as a good printer. One day, Butch didn't come to work. He was only 35 years old. And they said, oh, Butch is sick. He's got leukemia. Now, folks, 35 years ago, when you got leukemia, you were dead soon. The next day, they said, Butch is really sick. And they told him in the hospital, they said, Butch, would you like us to call your priest to come and give you last rites? And Butch answered back to the hospital staff and said, no, don't call my priest. Call Hank. They, they went down to my dad's workplace and they said, they said uh, Hank, Butch has asked to see you in the hospital. Dad went over to his locker and beside of the bottle of vodka, grabbed his good news Bible, tucked it in his pocket, and off he went to St. Elizabeth Hospital. And Dad went into that room and in his language shared Jesus Christ with that man who gave his heart to the Lord. The next day, I'm here to tell you the truth, my dad could come. He's 88 years old. It'd take him a while to get here. (laughs) But Dad could tell you, Butch gave his heart to Jesus that day. The next day, Butch died. Leukemia took his life. Jesus already had given him life. Now my father, a printer with ink under his fingernails, had made an initial impression for Christ and a lasting impact for all eternity. That is impressing the oppressor. 